We are recording, um, everyone. Welcome to today's Methods Hour. Um, we have a fun event today. We have our normal departmental Methods Hour, and I know some um, potential graduate students are joining us from the developmental area today. So for those students joining us, um, Methods Hour is just a regular seminar that we run uh, here through the department. It's um, across areas, across the department, and even across the university. We have folks involved through um, the history department, communications, um, anthropology, a lot of other departments. But the goal of Methods Hour is really just to talk about something methods-y. Um, it could be a, a difficult project you're doing. It could be a new insight you have. It could be just um, kind of an important debate or point of conversation that we want to just discuss as a group. Often we don't come to any resolution, but we think really hard about things and hopefully um, move our field and move our own work a little bit forward. So the format for today's Methods Hour, um, Dr. Natasha Chiku and I are gonna be presenting. Uh, I'll get things started and then I'll hand it over to um, Natasha to go through kind of the middle and end of the presentation. But we're just gonna talk a little bit generally about theory and methods in psychological science with a particular focus on developmental science, which is where um, Natasha and I specialize and we're not gonna go do a deep dive really into any theory or any method, but hopefully present some general ideas and um, um, topics that you can start thinking about, maybe how they apply to your own work, and then hopefully have a, a lot of time for discussion here at the end about, about this. So this was all inspired by a recent chapter that uh, Natasha and I wrote, and we're, we're excited to, to share it with you now. Um, as we go, feel free to raise your hand with questions or type questions into the chat. We'll moderate it. And I saw Dr. Uh, Pam Davis Keene here on the video. I just wanted to acknowledge her as one of the um, co-leaders, founders of Methods Hour, but um, who's not in the office this semester um, for good reason. So let's get into it. So how does theory define methods or apply to, to methods and, and vice versa? This is actually a slide very similar or a diagram similar to what I use in my teaching. I teach um, graduate statistics here. And in an idealized world, we have some observation. It could be from data, could be from the world around us. We find a theory related to that that could maybe explain the behavior, the observation we had, give us some hypotheses about it figure out what variables we'll use to test those hypotheses um, through some, some predictions that we explicate. And then eventually we'll maybe collect some data or find some existing data we can use to answer or test these predictions, eventually analyze them. And then here's the key thing, depending on what we find, we'll loop back up there to theory and say, okay, how does this relate to our theory? Should we modify our theory? Does it support the theory or not? So in this way, we have this loop kind of from theory all the way down to data analysis, and then hopefully back up to theory. We see the same thing in um, an article I like by George Fox. He says you have this tentative model, um, and the model could be a theory, it could be a conceptual framework, it could be something even drawn out with lines and arrows that you wanna test. And you criticize, you wanna test, you wanna change some element of that model, you collect data, you do that through an analysis, that analysis leads to an inference, and then maybe we revise our model somehow. Right? This is kind of the idealized way that we think science should go, and it, it's a good way. So then what are some of those theories? And in my area of research, I focus on developmental theory, but I really encourage you throughout this talk to think about the theories that guide and motivate your own work. When I think about landmark developmental theories, I'm just gonna minimize this up. Um, when I think of landmark developmental theories, I realize that the individual is at the center of many of them. Let me give you some examples, right? So um, Bronfen Brenner's bioecological model that motivates a lot of our work um, for many of us is just basically comes from the, the position that development is a process. And we have individuals, at least in the bioecological version of this model, we have individuals and they have their own genders and identities and ages and biologies. They're situated within a microsystem of like their family and their school, with, with, which is in 
a bigger exosystem of a neighborhood and a macro system of a culture and this mesosystem that helps integrate across all these different systems. And because this is development, we acknowledge that all of these things change over time or the chrono system. It's just a basic, basic premise of Bronfenbrenner. But if you dive into some of this work, you'll find quotes like, development is the phenomenon of continuity and change and the biopsychological characteristics of human beings, both as individuals and as groups, right? So both as individuals and as groups. How about another model or another theory? How about Samaroff's unified theory of development? Um, Samaroff, who was a scholar, a distinguished scholar in our department here at the University of Michigan, right? The kind of heart of this theory is again, moving beyond some sort of overstated nature nurture debate to understand interconnectedness, right? How a person again is kind of um, uh, exists within a system. And within this theory, there's multiple um, um, models or levels of development. There's a personal change. There's a context, a regulation, a representational model of development. And with all of these, you can see that there's this person, the self here, situated around others in a large social ecology that's geopolitical, that's community, that's family. And that individual self also has unique aspects of their own biology and psychology shown by those like um, black and gray dots. And do you see how the individual's own biology and psychology kind of uh, reverberates across infancy, childhood, adolescence, and we see this change. And in this 2010 paper, um, Samaroff actually says psychology's central focus is on the individuals. And you can see in this figure, you know, based on his paper, how the self is really situated within there. How about another one? Um, Garcia's, uh, Garcia Cole's um, integrated model of development here, developed with colleagues throughout the years. Um, and in this model, we see that social position factors like race and like gender are linked to things like racism and segregation that, that are linked to an environment. And then it starts to kind of um, spread out an environment is related to a culture, but also child characteristics, right? Individual elements of the child, which is related to their family and kind of eventually everything converges on these developmental competencies, which are many of the things that, that, um, that we study here in the department, things like an individual child's um, uh, coping with racism or, or cognition or emotion. And even within this integrated model here, um, she and her colleagues say these social position factors back in node number one are attributes of individuals that societies use to stratify, stratify or place individuals in a social hierarchy and that pertain to children of color. Right, so these social position factors are key factors of individuals and those individual factors are, are related to all of these aspects of an individual child's development. Am I making my point? In case I'm not, I'll do one more. I'll do one more. Phelan's dynamic systems or developmental systems theory of development. This is the one probably most akin to most of my work. You'll often see this represented as like a ball. Think of the ball as like the individual on some sort of plane here. And notice how this plane has behavior on an x-axis, the potential for that behavior on the y-axis, and then time going back on the z-axis. And the basic premise is that there's these kinds of pushes and pulls in the landscape of, of behavior, such that this black ball that represents the individual is more likely to fall into these nadirs, nadirs um, like an attractor state, an attractor state, and it'll take a lot of potential to bump some behavioral pattern out of this deep attractor state up into one of these hills, up onto one of these hills. And when talking about dynamic or developmental systems theory, Phelan has said things such as, a good developmental theory must encompass all outcomes, individual and universal. Kind of similar to Bronfenbrenner saying how we need to explain both groups and individuals. Okay, so maybe now I've made my point or even overstated my point about the role of individuals in developmental theory. The problem is 
potentially. Despite this emphasis, most of the quantitative approaches we use in developmental science utilize averages. And that's fine and that's good. It tells us about the groups, it tells us about the universals, but are we missing something about individuals? Right, so most of our models look very generally something like this. Again, students in my staff class are like, I thought I was past this, this is a Friday. But basically we have some outcome, right? Think of a Y for an individual I, and then there's a model, a model that's fit in parentheses because this model could have many terms, but notice how that model doesn't have any individual eyes. We use this model to explain all the individual eyes. And whatever we can't explain is air. And that's unique for each individual. And that's what's left over. Right? So we're trying to explain outcomes for individuals, but for general models. And that's reasonable to do, right? Because if we have a general model, well, then we're saying something about these normative processes in development. Oh no, right? So framing this within the broader general linear model, you can see how this model, this up here in parentheses, really is just represented by this big um, design matrix, the black box X, right? Some set of predictor variables X that's up here. We have that has a P dimensionality and we have those X's for each ind individual person in our data set up to our sample size total N. Right, so we're just trying to explain all the whys, all the individual observations um, that we have for each person, the outcome. By some set of predictors, we have one of those predictors, X for each person as well. How do we weight those Xs? Well, that's what this little beta box tells us about, right? For each of those Xs, there's a coefficient B or beta associated with them. That's really our model part. And then again, we have these errors left over. One for each person, right? See all the way down to sample size n. How much did our model miss the mark by for each person? And we make assumptions about these errors down here, right? We make some assumptions, basically that they're random. But what if they're not random? What if we've systematically missed information on some individuals? What if, what if there's some individual aspects of development that we can't capture with a normative universal model? How do we study those things? Again, what do I mean? So let's uh, pretend here we have some distribution, some, some developmental variable, something that changes over time like working memory. We have working memory here for children, let's say in blue. This is their distribution of scores. How good is a given child's working memory? They get a score on that. We plot it on this distribution, right? Number of youth is the y-axis. And then for a group of adolescents, we'll do the same thing in red. And means are good, averages can be helpful. We can say, right, right here in the middle of this normal distribution, a red line down, that's our average working memory for an adolescent. One value that represents working memory in adolescence, that's a useful metric. We can do the same thing for youth and, uh, or for children and say, there's our one average. And we can look at these averages and say, ah, yes, adolescents on average have better working memory than children. That's a good universal group level takeaway. But what about these folks, right? If these blue dots are children, maybe some children actually have working memory scores that are better than the average adolescent. And maybe some adolescents have working memory scores that are below what the average child has. So our means are useful in describing what's going on with kids and adolescents generally. But if I'm interested in understanding my child or the child I'm trying to educate or an individual adolescent coming into my clinic, those averages may not be so useful, right? So if we think of our data like this, right? This is Cattell's classic data box, so much classic theory in today's talk. We've got all our variables along this dimension X, all the people or youth in our data set up on Y. And usually what we do to get at these averages is we'll take this kind of coronal slice of the data box right here down the front. We'll focus on a single measurement occasion, maybe a couple in traditional longitudinal work. 
and we'll say, yes, look at all of these variables and look at all of these people. What I have to explain is the inter-individual variation, the variation between all of these kids on all of these variables, my working memory and the other things I'm measuring. Right? This is where our averages come from, and we use them to get at these what are called nomothetic inferences. Those are those group level or universal inferences. It explains variation across people. I think this applies to everybody. That is an assumption of the average. That is an assumption of things like regression models that the results describe each person equally well. And the ways that it doesn't describe people is random. But what if we return to this data box and take a different slice? What if we had the same variables and maybe a lot of people or maybe not, but a whole bunch of measurement occasions, not just two or three, like in traditional longitudinal work, even though that's great. But what if we had a whole, whole bunch of measurements? Um, I'm talking about ecological momentary assessment studies. I'm talking about data you might get from a Fitbit. I'm talking about daily diaries where you follow folks for 75 or 100 days. I'm talking other physiological measures, uh, data scraped from the web where you could get a whole bunch of measurement occasions on the same variables from the same people. If you have a data box that looks like that, then you can take an axial slice from the top, focus on just a single person, and instead describe variation that's intra-individual, right? I'm not, no longer looking at variation across variables and people. I'm looking at variation across variables and time within one person. That's intra-individual variation. And that affords what we call ideographic inferences. Inferences about just one kid. Inferences about that, that child who may have excellent working memory that's above the average for adolescents. How do I study that child? Well, maybe I could study them many, 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 many times and look at their intra-individual variation. And so really different kind of take compared to most um, analytic techniques that, that, that we use that are based on averages. That's where I'm gonna stop and hand it off to Natasha to give you some examples of that. The sound goes ahead if you'd like to use it. Yeah. So, hi everyone. I am um, going to be following Adrienne up, which is a very difficult task. Uh, but she talked to you a little bit about some of the prominent theories and development that focus on or consider the individual, and then how in some ways our methods may be more aligned or more appropriate for considering groups. So I'm gonna give you some examples right now of how we can reveal within person variation. This generally requires the use of what we call intensive longitudinal data or time series data with upwards of 60 observations of the same individuals and the same variables over time. So I'm gonna walk through two different studies that use time series data uh, to make some ideographic inferences about development. And I'm not gonna focus as much on the results, though I will show them to you, but rather on the types of questions we can ask, uh, the type of data collection that's necessary to collect some intensive longitudinal um, data, and then also the analysis we use to analyze this sort of data. So the first uh, study I'm going to review is on adolescent friendship. And there's been a wealth of research that suggests that social relationships in adolescents, friendships in adolescents, have this unique and important impact on later behavior and adjustment. And in fact, uh, research suggests that affiliation with deviant peers um, can really influence antisocial behavior. But there are a lot of questions, right? Is it that deviant fears seek out like others? Is it that deviant peers reinforce each other's behavior? And we really don't know the extent to which these findings generalize to an individual adolescent. So why is it that 
some adolescents who endorse having deviant peers do not also endorse having antisocial behavior while others do. So in a 2004 article, Dishion looked at how friendship dynamics, so the interplay between peer interactions influence antisocial behavior. And he did so by collecting data from around 200 boys starting at age 10, who were then assessed yearly until age 24. And he asked them a bunch of questions on their friendships with their peers. And then the focus of our conversation today, he coded this really interesting peer interaction task. And he coded continuously for 25 minutes, their interpersonal behaviors and their conversation topics. And what he did was he coded these on what's called a state space grid, which sort of represents the behaviors between a target child and a peer over these 25 minutes. And you can see here that this dyad, this target child and their peer, have a pretty like centralized or localized uh, behavior interplay over time. They're mostly positive interactions or mostly conversational interactions. We would call this a really organized conversation. A positive interaction by one child is likely to be followed by a positive interaction by their peer. Now look at this second dyad. It looks really different. That's because they have the same density of interactions. They're both coded over the same amount of time, but this dyad is much more disorganized. You can see that even if a child is giving some sort of positive or so calm conversational um, response, their peer's response might be negative. It might be directive. It might really vary. You can actually measure the predictability and the organization of these sort of interpersonal behaviors using an entropy value. And we would say that dyad one has really low entropy. Their conversation is predictable. You know, or you can predict what was gonna happen. That conversation is organized. Dyad two has really high entropy. It's disorganized. It's not very predictable. So now that we have this sort of more intensively coded data, let me talk to you a little bit about their results. First, to review some inter-individual results, we generally found that antisocial youth, or they generally found, this is not my study. <laughs> I wish it was, it's great, you should all read it. <laughs> that antisocial youth spent more time with their friends. But then when they looked at their behavior at age 24, time with their friends, whether antisocial or not, did not predict their antisocial behaviors as an adult. So then they went ahead back to that entropy value that I just talked about, about to the organization and predictability of their conversations. And again, not to bog you down, but generally when they looked at how much of their time was spent in rule-breaking conversations and how organized the content of their conversations were, they found that youth who demonstrated high rule-breaking conversations and low entropy, so they were in an organized dialogue between peers that centered on rule breaking activity, they advanced the greatest antisocial behavior at age 24. So it wasn't just having deviant peers. It wasn't even just entropy or the organization of their conversations. It was really that the presence and nature of interaction matters. And this has a ton of implications if you think about it. One popular intervention for antisocial behavior is like group therapy or group interventions. But think about when you get a bunch of deviant adolescent boys in the same room. It may be that they're reinforcing their deviant talk um, and overwhelming potentially adult supportive um, behavior. However, there are still questions that persist. Not much is known about the individualized nature of this relationship. As you can see here, and I'm sure some of you are thinking, behavior was still aggregated across these individual boys. So we're still not quite at the individual. A more granular ideographic approach could potentially sort of parse out which interactions for which youth are um, meaningful at the individual level. So the second paper I'm going to talk to you about today uh, combines this intensive longitudinal data with a personalized network approach. And this is a paper that Dr. Belts wrote in 2013 on gender differences in children's play. 
uh, the research generally suggests that when children play, they do so in gender dependent ways. Girls tend to demonstrate more positive affect in same gender groups. Boys tend to demonstrate more vigorous activity in same gendered group. However, these results generally are derived from averages. So across time, it's thought that one moment of positive affect represents like 10 or 15 minutes of positive affect and across children. So there's the thought that an average represents an individual girl's positive affect well, which leads to questions about the individual characteristics and the temporal nature of play behavior. So Dr. Belts and her colleagues looked at this by assessing how children's play behavior unfolded over time in relationship to their peers. They did so by coding the positive affect and vigor of activity of 19 sort of play groups of children every 10 seconds over 90 time points. And here's an example of the data you get when you code activity and affect continuously for about 15 minutes. In these thick red and blue lines, I'm showing you average affect and average activity. And you can see, while some people seem fairly well characterized by this average line, other people are not as well characterized or they might be mischaracterized by this average line. The average affect for boys is right above two, but you can see that there's a boy who seems to be below two almost consistently. He might be mischaracterized by this average. So let's again, look at the results. I have some inter-individual results for you first. So first they collapse play behavior across time and play groups. And you can see that consistent with the literature, girls tend to have more positive affect while playing. Boys tend to engage in more vigorous activity. But these results don't generalize across time points and play groups. So here is a select group of boys you can see that their positive affect is higher than the average girls and the average boys affect. And here's a select group of girls. You can see that their activity levels are more vigorous than the average boy group and the rest of the girl group. This led Dr. Belts to conduct this intra-individual uh, analysis that's called a unified structural equation model or a USEM. So don't get scared. <laughs> That is a big, scary model. Again, we're not gonna get too caught up in the results. I'm gonna give you a brief explanation of what you see here. And then I'm gonna tell you about the inferences that you can get from using this network approach. So a USEM derives this personalized or person, or rather in this case, dyad specific uh, network that's continuously modeling the positive affect and vigor of activities for just this dyad. So, these relations are unique to boy A, boy B, and boy C. And it's modeling these relations contemporary or concurrently, so at the same moment in those uh, solid lines. And then it's also model modeling the lagged relations. So how one moment is predicting the next um, in those dashed lines. All of these models fit well in case you were concerned. But what's really interesting is the inferences you can make. So first I'll point out that there are quite a few dash lines coming out of one variable and back into the same variable, like for example, right here. And that just suggests that this is an autoaggressive effect, as you would expect. The best predictor of Boise's positive affect at one moment is his positive affect a second ago or five seconds ago. The other thing you might notice here, and this is interesting, is that almost all of the other connections, especially between variables are concurrent. This suggests that positive affect is increasing, for example, for boy A and boy C at the same time. It's not that they are influencing each other's play behaviors, but rather it's all happening at the same time instead of preceding one another. So to summarize some of these intra-individual results, we quantified or they quantified the sort of contemporaneous and lagged relations by gender, they generally found that girls exhibited more lagged effects of positive affect, meaning that one girl's positive affect 
10 seconds later influence another girl's positive affect. They also found that in the boys, they tended to have more concurrent play behaviors. So one boy's vigorous activity was ramping up at around the same time as another boy's vigorous play activity. And this is revealing some temporal dynamics that are underlying gender differences. These findings that would have been missed by just that first typical inter-individual analysis. So in the final part of our talk today, now that I've reviewed a couple of studies that have sort of well incorporated intensive longitudinal designs and ideographic approaches, we want to chat briefly about how we can incorporate ideographic work and what are some of the defining features of the research questions we can use, the study designs available, and data analyses. Like I said, we think there are about three main ways that we can incorporate ideographic research. Um, the first is by conceptualizing our research questions a little differently. Instead of considering the average or the group, it might be important to instead consider extreme individual differences or rather like how a child or an adult is unique um, and not just different from a mean or different from each other. The fluctuations we see um, in individuals over time can be assessed on relatively short term or relatively short time scales. And the fluctuations or intra-individual variability over that time might actually be a meaningful psychological construct in itself. This has been studied a lot in the aging literature where they look at sort of the instability of cognitive processes over time um, and could be sort of brought down to adolescent and the child literature as well. The second place is study designs. Um, ideographic approaches generally require many observations of the same person over time. Uh, some of this data collection is already, or some of this data is already available to researchers. Physiological data is generally collected quite densely. Um, in fMRI work, there is a data point taken every couple of seconds over several minutes. And in a lot of like infant and toddler studies, interactions are videotaped or recorded. And so you can code those in continuous ways to get more data. Um, it would also be important to consider temporal granularity. So there is a part of this that is important to consider where you have to know like what the construct of interest is and what's the appropriate time scale to measure it on. For example, it might be most appropriate to measure changes in emotion using some sort of ecological and momentary assessment. We're assessing them potentially several times a day. Uh, on the other hand, it might be more helpful to get like a weekly measure of academic achievement. Um, you also have to use appropriate measures. So uh, a lot of Dr. Bell's work looks at this or uses this, but a lot of measures that we have now are more appropriate to uncover the average. They ask individuals to report back on their behavior or their thoughts or feelings over the past three months or the past year. Um, so when you're working in intensive longitudinal data that's asking about your experiences today, questions might need to be reworded or new measures may need to be created completely to better assess sort of what is happening on a day-to-day -day or moment-to-moment -moment basis. You're also gonna have to think about how to best maximize participant retention. Um, participants who are, who are um, recruited into 75 or 100 day studies are giving up a lot of their time to participate. They need to be adequately compensated and followed up with to make sure that they're completing these studies and minimizing sort of missing data. And then also, of course, it's important to consider power and the time points needed. Uh, for example, GIMI or USEM is most often conducted with at least 60 data points. Um, other approaches like dynamic structural equation modeling is generally more lax on the amount of time points. You can do it with much fewer time points, but you need a lot more participants to have enough power. And then finally, there are, I would say, sort of like fewer person-specific approaches, fewer approaches that can specifically model the individual without considering the average. But there's actually a spectrum of ideographic approaches that we could use. Um, 
that lie somewhere between sort of a mean based regression and a gimme or a graphical VAR model. And those can include sort of growth curve models with random slopes. Those can include a DSEM approach. And psychological science can move closer to using some of those approaches, which can prioritize sort of the temporal inferences and personalized inferences as well. So we've given you some of our thoughts um, about what are important areas to sort of look at or consider for moving ideographic science forward, but we're actually really interested in your thoughts. Um, like how relevant is ideographic work to the theories you use? What would they look like? What are the limitations of those types of approaches? I'll moderate some of this. And I think maybe we should, should turn I go that for... off. And I think that yeah. if we turn that off, it activates the overhead speakers. Oh, great. Lots of questions. Can you still hear us? Can you still hear us all right? Okay, great. Pam, yeah, please. Lots of comments and questions. We're hoping this to be more of a discussion, even though it's going to be to the, the hybrid one. Stop the share. Yeah, there we go. Okay, great. Yeah, Pam? So we started off with the series. Um, one of the things, in the, you know, I use the bioecological model as well is that it suggests you were really honing in on the individual, but one of the things that we do on top of doing the, you know, the average you know, OLS or basic regression is ignore the multi-level uh, yeah. aspect of the individual within context, right? So we're hardly ever analyzing the data correctly for people who are you know, within context, allowing for the correlation between the individual and the context. And I thought about this, Specifically with your paper, Adrian, looking at child play, you know, is that at a child care center? Is it during school? Is it in a certain structure, right? That's that's related to the way that their behavior is showing up in those time periods that you're looking at. So I'm just really interested. I know you think about this, I think about this, about these individual level models within the multi-level context of which basically the first models you were showing would suggest to us we should be looking at. That's a really fun question. And to, to be completely transparent, Natasha and I, we, did, we made the choice to kind of home in on the individual to like make a point. But your point that it's not just group or individual, it's lots of things in between is, is, absolutely, is absolutely true and vital. And that's why I think Natasha kind of ended with, um, and happy to hear there's, there's lots of fair criticisms about ideographic approaches too. Um, but if we kind of put the provocative statement out there to kind of go ideographic, maybe it just brings people a little bit closer to some of these different levels of analysis. Um, um, to answer your question about that uh, 2013 paper, these were actually unfamiliar kids, um, kids who were unfamiliar with each other and they were brought in and kind of randomly placed into a, a play group with other kids they didn't know like in a research laboratory. So that's how that was done, but you're absolutely right. If you try to replicate that study in like a childcare center, you would get likely different patterns of results, maybe some self-selection into who your peers are, right? And, and those types of behaviors, but then you could study that with those entropy models, right? So there's, there's a lot of really cool possibilities. Yeah, thanks for your comment. Michael, and anyone else, please just feel free to chime in. Yeah, thanks for uh, this presentation. I think it's a really cool discussion, especially having uh, prospective students um, on the call as well. I had a couple of questions. I'll stick to uh, my first kind of two part question, and that's related kind of to the theoretical models that were discussed at the start. Um, first, like the theoretical models are largely kind of Western basis, so they place the individual at the center. And so I wonder how that would vary if you were in a different culture, maybe some Eastern culture where maybe the individual isn't so placed in the center. And then second, when you start modeling additional parameters of the individual, um, they get more complex. And so models that are already kind of not so parsimonious and not easily to falsify, how difficult is it to test that theory um, and kind of 
be able to have something that's falsifiable and testable? Yeah, yeah, both great questions. You're absolutely right about um, the individual being at the center of these models and what would different theories or different models um, look like in, in different types of cultures. And I think the same is true for different areas across psychology. You know, we've brought a developmental perspective to this um, where there's a lot of focus on individual differences and extreme individual differences, not completely, um, but a lot. And maybe this ideographic approach then has less utility in other areas for other questions if the questions don't have an individual at the center. So this is, again, just one example that may apply a lot in some areas and may not apply in other areas and, and suggest we need different, different types of work or models. Um, as for model complexity, um, absolutely. That is one of the downsides of an ideographic approach. The models become complex and then drawing inferences from them become complex, whether they're inferences about falsifying a, a potential theory. It's, it's more about then like a theory for a kid at a moment of time situated within a context, right? So that's what we end up testing in many ways. And that's really cool in some ways. It adds a lot of nuance. And it's really complex and maybe too complex in other ways. You probably noticed in Natasha's slides, even when you get it intra-individual or like personalized models, there's still like a draw to somehow average across them to summarize what's going on in those models. And that can be important in figuring out ways to do that kind of combining that are... Um, still somehow kind of honor or capture the heterogeneity in the original data is something that we're working on, a lot of groups are working on. And right now that um, there's kind of a, a tendency, as you know, to kind of borrow like graph theoretical or data science type metrics to do this type of summarizing of individual data for whatever that's worth. Jackie? Hi, <clears throat> sorry. Hi, Adrian. Yeah, thanks very much for this. So I, as I was listening to you, and I, I know what well, I was thinking, well, quite a lot of our data sets also have dyads, right? So, and if we're thinking about adulthood, <laughs> um, then, you know, people live uh, as a couple in the same household. <laughs> typically, at least. <laughs> and so, and there are theories about the spillover of um, work and family or emotions between one partner and the other partner. Um, I mean, there are also theories about um, spillovers between parents and their adolescent children, right, in terms of emotions. Um, uh, so, I guess, well, I think your models also apply to that, right? But there may not be, um, uh, we may not have the micro level day to day. Well, sometimes I guess people are collecting day to day analyses, but often it's over longer periods of time, right? Yeah. So do you want to comment on that a little bit? Yeah, that sounds like just a really great example of like a, a theory that's not completely group or individual, but a theory that's like in toward the dyad level and would probably require an analysis that again, is not completely person specific across many, many, many time points, but again, moves a little bit closer. Um, so like I think Natasha mentioned models like dynamic SEM models could handle that type of dyad coupling. And maybe it's like actually a really elegant compromise, you know, getting away from some of the limitations of a purely ideographic approach or like large, large, large scale theory that might be particular to a given uh, culture or society and move, move the theory in a little bit and move the approach up. And yeah, maybe we should talk more. <laughs> it's a great example. Thank you so much. Daniel. Hi, <clears throat> great. Uh... Great talk, thank you very much. I've got my construction headphones because it's a little noisy here, but uh, I can hear everything. <laughs> so, uh, what's that? You look great. Thank you, thank you. I'm, I'm implementing the latest fashion statement. But uh, <laughs> I had a question about, this may seem um, a, little, a little afield, but I wonder how some of what you're talking about relates to issues of test-retest reliability Across, across time. And 
coming from my own literature, which is attention and cognitive control, Stroop-like tasks of this nature, it's often found that test-retest reliability is really low for many of these effects. And others have written about this in the literature, but the idea is that, for example, if we measure the Stroop effect in each of, I don't know, 100 people at time one and rank order them in terms of the size of their Stroop effect, then if we do the same thing at time two, the rank order of the people changes substantially. And so they, you know, it, there seems to be this low test retest reliability. Um, but what's not often done in those sorts of studies is to measure the Stroop effect in each individual across time in the way that you're describing, like this very longitudinal, like let's measure 60 times or something, the Stroop effect or, or some other measure of cognitive control. And so I started, as you were speaking, to wonder whether something about the time series of how the Stroop effect evolves maybe um, would be more predictive of individual differences, right? Because oftentimes people want to do test retest reliability to say, hey, if you have a larger Stroop effect, you're less impulsive or you're more impulsive. Like they want to correlate that with some other personality variable and draw conclusions about the role of cognitive control as indexed by the Stroop effect in this real world kind of thing, like impulsivity or something like that. But that's hard when test retest reliability is low. So I, I started to think, well, could it be that, you know, uh, maybe certain subjects have a more variable Stroop effect over time than others? And that might somehow explain the lack of test retest reliability across time. And if we could somehow factor in to the equation that some subjects have a Stroop effect that varies wi widely over time while others don't, that somehow that would um, be helpful. So I, I don't know, I just, I, I apologize if this is a little bit unfocused, but it just came to mind when you were speaking. So I, I wondered if you might have something to say. Daniel? I am smiling so wide because we are doing that as you as we speak. Um, we have adolescents in a study where they're doing 100 days of the Stroop. And uh, we're, we're, you might be disappointed in us because we haven't, we can talk about the details later, but we haven't figured out, out a way to get the, the Stroop effect um, proper given our study constraints, meaning like the congruent versus the incongruent trials. Um, and I think it's the reliability of some of those reaction time type measures that's actually been called into question or um, show some of the patterns you're talking about. So what we did instead is we've just provided adolescents with an impossibly long list of incongruent pairs um, and we see how far they get. And every day we see how far they get in these incongruent pairs. And um, so far it is relating to things like real world impulsivity, things like real world substance use, um, so far as we can tell. But both the, both the average over time. Yeah. So if you collapse all those um, data points into one and get the average, that's related to impulsivity. Yeah. But then also sort of the variability as you were talking about, Daniel, sort of variability in their scores over time and how variable they are. So are they pretty much the same or stable across 100 days or do they experience sort of large fluctuations? That's also a predictor of sort of impulsivity and risk taking. Right, so the adolescents where one day their Stroop is really low, they don't match many of the incongruent pairs and then high, then low, then high, then low, then high. The degree of that variation is actually related positively related, more day-to-day -day variation, more real-world impulsivity. Um, but your point about, more generally, your point about kind of the reliability of intra-individual measures is a huge issue right now. How do you, and this is the conundrum, this is kind of the paradox. So how do we normally test the reliability of something? Say like test retest reliability. I'll give you the questionnaire today and I'll give you the questionnaire in two weeks. So when I give someone the same questionnaire every day and I'm interested in changes over days, am I assessing reliability or am I assessing change, right? So the, it, this type of intensive longitudinal work just kind of flips on its head the way that we think about some things in like the nomothetic space. So figuring out how to assess 
reliability of multiple forms, when we have 100 forms of the Stroop, for instance, how to separate reliability from meaningful intra-individual changes is, um, is a tricky mix right now, um, but, but there's emerging procedures out there for it. So, so I don't think your question was tangential at all. It actually gets to the heart of a lot of the current challenges, I think. Thank you. Hi, Dave. Oh, is that me? Yeah, please. Oh, Sorry. Okay. Uh, 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 very interesting talk. Uh, there, there's a, a set of um, research questions. I like to see if your methods or thinking would provide insights about how to deal with them. And that has to do with uh, uh, what I've been referring to as tail phenomena. That is, these are effects that don't happen at the average but rather happen at the extremes or in a subgroup. So for example, let's say that you wanna study um, hesitancy toward wearing masks. Now the vast majority of people wear masks, but some people don't. And you would like to find out either what is different about their psychology or even uh, more pertinent, whether or not interventions are there interventions that would work with them? That is, there could be interventions that work at the average for the bulk of people, but don't work for them. That's one example. <clears throat> Excuse me, another example is uh, whenever I give a talk at a medical school, I invariably get the question about what do we do, quote unquote, with the resistant student? That is, there always seems to be a subclass of about 5% of medical students who just don't take advice. And uh, even though they're 5%, they absorb over 50% of their instructor's uh, efforts and time, if you will. And so um, uh, uh, medical educators would love to know how do, I how do we identify these people, for example, before they get into medical school or what do we do once we have them? So the, the overall question is, are, to what extent, can you comment on how your methods might apply to not the individual, but let's say subgroups of interest? Yeah, that's a really fun set of questions. I think um, if I think the general principle would apply, and please others brainstorm with me. I think the general principle would apply that. <laughs> right here's the challenge for those um, resistant learners. Could we get them to do a 50-day intensive longitudinal study? Right. Because my answer is let's get more data from this smaller group of people. And then we can use one of these methods that integrates time and people, essentially increases power through time and people. Now, if, if the folks who are resistant to wearing masks and the, and the folks who are um, you know, maybe uh, challenging instructor resources in the medical school are doing those things, they might not be so compliant for an intensive longitudinal study, which brings up questions about, well, how, how representative are the intensive longitudinal data that we have then? Fair question. Um, but if you could develop a reward structure um, or even maybe get those instructors instead to do an intensive longitudinal study of their interactions with the student, um, although you always hate to ask instructors to do more if they're already being um, stretched thin, so to speak, but if you could find a creative way to get more data on that group of individuals, then these methods would apply. These methods would apply. I think the difficulty with like a nomothetic or an averaging approach is when you only have 5%, whenever you compare them to the 95%, you're, you, break, you just have this statistical challenge in terms of the power and air and all of these sorts of things. But if there'd be a way to get more data on those individuals, then this, then that's a tractable problem, kind of analytically. I don't know if anyone else has thoughts about that. No other thought other than uh, uh, with more data, you could do things like regression uh, displacement and so forth. But yep. uh, yeah, different uh, types of clustering. Um, like the USM model Natasha shows has like a data driven clustering. You can see if like, right, so, so there's lots of possibilities with more data. Yeah, yeah, but um, with only a single or a couple of time points, 
that's a little bit more challenging. Great, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, hi. I know we're out of time, but there's one thing that I always wonder, um, yeah. you know, that you, the, the picture about the idiosyncratic US, USEM model. Yeah. How does that uh, factor in self-regulatory processes? Let's assume one of the yeah. big problems uh, in child development, temper tantrums. Yeah. So the child has to learn that when their, you know, aggression level comes up to a certain point, they have to regulate themselves down. So we see always, oh, the, the past is the best predictor of the next stage. Yeah. But something is missing there. So yeah. if they reach a certain critical point, yeah. then the self-regulatory processes, the sign has to flip. Yeah. It becomes yeah. negative. And I think this is we're missing a lot of yeah. important aspects of human life is this yeah. self-regulatory yeah. negative effect. Yeah. If I agree with you, models like we showed you there with that network approach, they, there's, they assume weak stationarity. Right, so they're absolutely like by definition are not capturing this type of crescendo that you're talking about. But I think there are a lot of, and even more so now, like continuous time models, like different types of um, cusp and catastrophe models that set out to do exactly that. A lot of them um, that I know of are within like the intervention literature or the substance use literature, like trying to predict relapse. You know, so predicting observations up until a point and then you smoked a cigarette again you know so i think uh those kind of self-regulation models would be a much better match maybe for that type of like cusp or catastrophe model like that a continuous time event prediction what we're doing here with 10 second increments assuming weak stationarity i know i don't think it's a good fit for like an emotion regulation model either um yeah i think it would just kind of it, 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 it probably would wash out or average across those effects. Yeah. Well, I wonder whether they can be integrated because it may, basically means that it's, it's an intercept, negative intercept slope relation. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. Good point that, that, that actually the model yeah. it, it could be yeah. somehow. We do have external input like models into that. So, maybe like self regulation could be modeled as some sort of external input, even though it's an internal system. Yeah. Um, because just because it is like time limited in some ways. So, so maybe they could, maybe they could, I'd have to think about that. Yeah. All right, well, thank you everybody. We went a smidge over time, but it's been great to have this discussion. I hope it was provocative, at least in a, in a little way. Again, not arguing that we all need to go out and do this work, but that it's just a cool area of work that maybe is more possible now than it used to be because of technological advances and it can kind of change the way we see some of the phenomena we study. So maybe it's a, a potential compliment. Um, for those of you here at Michigan, our next Methods Hour won't be until a month. It'll be March 25th. And actually Dr. Henry Cowles from um, History is gonna talk to us about the history of the scientific method. I think he calls it from Dewey to Darwin. So um, <laughs> it'll be a fun talk on March 25th. Feel free to email Natasha or me if you have any questions and thanks for stopping by. <laughs>